So it's a normal Tuesday, and I'm running around Lordran setting things on fire. You know, as you do. And out of nowhere, I get a phone call from my lawyers about some guy beating every Souls game with consumables. They had a lawsuit all printed up and ready to go, but then they told me what consumable he was using. Needless to say, we dropped the lawsuit. I don't think there was any amount of damage that we could have done to him, and he wasn't already doing to himself. Tick. 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 Thwack. Yeet. Yeah, I was tied up in his basement and forced to make throwing knife sounds for two weeks, and all I could eat was mold off the walls. It was one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. JK Leeds is a monster. <laughs> a monster! My conclusion is that we're dealing with a clear case of post-traumatic knife disorder. Finally, I made sure to get Throne Defender really, really low on health before killing Throne Watcher and then managing to finish Defender off. Shortly after the release of the Dark Souls 2 Throwing Knives video, I was arrested and fined for practicing therapy without a license, despite Jake Elise assuring me that would not happen. Working with him damaged me both professionally and financially. So suffice to say, I regret taking part in it. Also had to put in a new window, but it's pretty much a monthly occurrence nowadays. Throwing knives for the Gwyn. He's nameless no more. With all these knives sticking out, I now dub you a Gwyn Cushion. This is one tiny dance you don't want to hold you closer. Honestly, his jokes are so bad that I've threatened him with divorce so many times. Both of which can be avoided by just walking to the right. If there was any dispute whether I could get past this boss, I adjudicate that it is indeed possible. When I spoke to JK Leeds on the phone, his voice was muffled. It sounded like he was laying face down in a tent. Turns out, that's exactly what he was doing. The game began like most of my days at university, in that I wake up with no memory of anything that happened the night before, and proceed to take off all my clothes and head out into the street. It might just be possible, but if I'm honest, it's way above my skill level. I'm past vicaring at this point. JK Leeds? It sounds like some investment firm. Who the f*** is this casual? This is it. We're here at last, the final throwing knife challenge of the Soul series. All roads have led to Elden Ring. The current score is JK Leeds 3, Soul Series 2, with DS2, DS3, and Demon Souls being knifed, and Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne living to knife another day. Elden Ring will be the ultimate challenge, I'm sure, but also offers us the largest variety of tools. So let's cover the rules. All damage must be done with throwing knives or throwing knife variants. The goal is to beat the final boss. I'm going to at least attempt every Remembrance boss also, but beating the final boss is the only real goal, so anything else I do is a bonus. With that done, let's twist the knife one last time. First, we choose the Samurai class, as I think this is the best setup of stats for our build. Dexterity is the most important, as pretty much all the knives scale with this, with strength being a secondary one for most of them. We then give the grafted scion a kiss for good luck and then dive off into the abyss. The adventure then begins just like my bachelor party did a few years ago, complete with skin dyed green and then we visit Kale, where I sell all my worldly possessions to buy 15 throwing knives. Luckily, there's also a golden rune 2 nearby to let me purchase another 10. The basic throwing knives have A scaling in dex and B scaling in strength this go round. I decided to test out the damage against the nearby tree sentinel and it was not good, and I was forced to retreat. But then again, he is heavily armoured. You can see against this normal soldier, the damage is quite knife actually. Also, they're quick to throw. Oh hey Melina, knife to meet you. With Torrent now on hand, I found out that you can also throw knives while mounted, so that could come in handy. It actually never came in handy. I complete a few chores quickly, like grabbing the Dectus Medallion, the Physic, going to the round table, buying a sacred seal, and then chucking a knife at the Black Blade Kindred. Some for Kindred full damage there. I upgraded my flasks and decided to do the classic run starter of cheesing this knight's cavalry, which I did with absolutely no issue first try. Yep, first try. Knight Knight Sweet Cavalry. With the 42,000 Blood Echoes in hand, I level up Vigor, Strength and Dexterity, as these will be the main stats I'll need here. 
There's also the ball method of getting souls, which I'll use when I need to buy more knives. Speaking of which, let's go get some more types of knives. Our old friend the Kukri can be purchased from the merchant there in the Weeping Peninsula. They are slow to throw, and cause bleed as before with an S scaling index. The amount of bleed can be slightly increased by leveling arcane, but it's only C scaling, so it's not going to make much of a difference. I also buy the Kaling kit from Craft, and then test out the Kukri on this mounted knight as he drops the Golden Vow Ash of War. As I'm a long way from being able to get the Faith to use the incantation version, putting this on a basic dagger will have to do for the damage boost for now. This version only lasts 45 seconds as opposed to the 80 seconds of the incant version, but it should still help us out. I also went to this merchant in Kaelid who sells Poison Bone Darts, the poison knife equivalent in this game. It's a shame there's no rot knives, but these will have to do. You can craft them also, but honestly they're pretty cheap to buy here so it's just easier. I grabbed the second half of the Dectus Medallion and Radagon Saw Seal to boost our stats further, and with our Golden Vow equipped to a dagger, we can begin. First up is Margot Robbie the Fell Barbie. My strategy here was simple, use Poison Bone Darts until he's poisoned, cast Golden Vow, switch to using Kukri, panic in the menu after realising Radigan's Saw Seal wasn't equipped, proc a bleed to get him to phase 2, get trapped against the edge of the arena, escape somehow, and proc a second bleed to bring down this little Margitch. I now begin the slow process of levelling up Faith, as I'd need 27 of it for the incantation version of Golden Vow, but also I wanted to add yet another knife to our repertoire, the Bone Dart. This one can only be crafted with thin beast bones, and I'd like to be able to purchase these infinitely, so time to kill this Jedi Imitator. He's pretty easy as he gives us ample time to poison him, and then the Kukri bleed him out as the bell tolls for him. He just wasn't able to bear our assault. With his bell bearing, we can buy all the thin beast bones we need to craft a whole bunch of bone darts. I wanted to boost our damage even higher, and now that we have a second talisman slot from beating Margit, I know just the talisman to do it. I take the high road into this cave to face off with Ian Golem, the guard, who appears to have a distinct weakness to toothpicks being thrown at his ankles. It could just be me, but it feels like the range of our knives is really good in this game. I can easily just stay at this distance, and none of his attacks even come close to hitting me. With his defeat, we now get the Blue Dancer charm, boosting our damage when we have low equip load, which we definitely will for the majority of this run. Now, there's one important bit of business we need to take care of. We need to get to Patches in Murkwater Cave. But to do that, we have to get past Nerigus, and this highlights one type of enemy we are really going to struggle with on this run. NPCs. I mean, just look at this! Ultra instincting my knives like he's Elden Goku. Thankfully, Yura is here to help this time, and Nera Justice is served. Patches was nowhere near as bad, as he's got lots of openings such as when he does the breath attack. We keep him alive, as we need him to buy fan daggers. At the moment, he only has a few to sell, but he'll have an unlimited amount a bit later on. From what I've heard already, I'm a big fan of these, but we'll come back to that. Also, just to mention inventory limits, all of the knives we can hold up to 40 of, apart from the Kukri, which we can only hold 30. For now, we return to Stormvale Castle and discuss our options with our Gostock Broker. We decided to take the easy route through. So now, onto Rick the God. Who says he's the easiest remembrance boss, eh? Uh, well, me actually. This was alarmingly easy. Poison whittled away his health, and I just pelted him with darts and then Kukri when he started doing his phase transition. I actually only took one hit the whole fight, and I realised that I forgot to even use Golden Vow. Did, did I make myself too powerful? The Naifu faithful were screaming from the grafters with this victory. Make sure to comment below if you consider yourself a Naifu faithful. I am hugely insecure and need validation. I realised it might be good to get the health regen and one hit shield tiers for my physic to make it actually useful, so I went and quickly killed the Erdtree avatar by James Cameron. Poison and bone darts make quick work of this thing like you wouldn't believe. I figured I wouldn't be needing Godric's Remembrance, so I used it and leveled up Arcane to help a little with the bleed from our Kukri. Here in this area with the lakes, I need to learn a new crafting recipe, which allows us to make crystal darts, the sixth and final type of throwing knife, but also probably the least useful, so we'll only crack that out when we really need it. More importantly though, Patches has now moved here and sells unlimited fan daggers which is perfect. After farming a few more echoes, we buy a bunch and we are all set. 
As the Academy is our next destination and we need to grab the key anyway, I thought it might be worth taking on Glintstone Smaragon. This was a pretty easy fight actually, we procked the poison right away and then aimed for his head with the bone darts. The damage isn't amazing from each individual one, but with how quick and spammable they are, combined with being able to hit the dragon's head thanks to their range, that damage really racks up, and with just bone darts and a few poison darts, we put Smarag back in the bag. Also, I had read some claims online about these knives having poise damage, but I have yet to see that. I hit this dragon a lot of times in the head, and he didn't stagger once, and in fact, I don't think I got any staggers on anything this entire run. With key in hand, we can now enter the academy, and like any good college, it has fraternities and hazing rituals. I think I'm going to like it here. I see a lot of books, and I'm pretty sure this boss knows them off by heart. That's why he's the Red Wolf. Okay, I deserve that death. But second try, our usual strategy holds true. Proc that poison to start, and then cast Golden Vow. I decided to stick with bone darts, as I felt like their speed was a bona fide advantage in this fight. I didn't even need to use that many of them, and before long, this boss becomes the Dead Wolf of Radigan. After an intense battle with this carrier knight, and this mini Zaki admires my feet, it's time for Renala. Phase 1 was no real issue, just a quick throwing dagger to hurt the little ones, and then you can actually poison Renala so she still takes damage even while she's in her shield. Right before the end of Phase 1, I drink the Physic and cast Golden Vow again, and now the real battle begins. We proc poison again, and the Kukrus were pretty good at interrupting her attacks, but she seemed to get pretty angry in the latter part of this, and summoned constantly, meaning I had to do a lot of running away. With a few last throwing daggers, we cause a lunar eclipse, and Renala disappears. Of course, we're not done yet in Lernia. Let's see if our knife build can carry us through this manner. I didn't think Loyal Knight Roretta would be much trouble, and for the most part, I was correct. She can't be poisoned, but just the standard throwing daggers can do decent damage when you get many of them in quick succession. I did get a bit reckless towards the end, and nearly threw the fight after some close calls, but one last knife got the job done, and allowed us to speak to Rani and initiate her quest. Instead of faffing finding Blythe though, I decided to head up to Altus Plateau, as not only can you initiate the Radan Festival by resting at a grace here, but I can also kill a Gillica to get the Ritual Sword Talisman, giving us a 10% boost to our damage when our health is full. On my way back to Kaelid, I stopped by Celia Crystal Tunnel to get some cracked crystals to craft some crystal darts in case I needed them, and now it was time for Radan Ackroyd. Now, it was here I came to two realizations. First, it takes me two flask chugs to get back to full health, and second, most of Radan's attacks one-shot me. This is probably because I'm naked, haven't leveled Vigor very much, and I'm wearing Radigan's Sword Seal. I could solve the first issue by grabbing a few tears that I had forgotten about, and I could solve the second issue by grinding for some runes to level up some more. But I was feeling stubborn, so I didn't do the second thing. This led to a few deaths, including some where I was painfully close to victory due to one wrong dodge costing me. Poison was pretty easy to proc on Radan, and then I'd pelt him with bone darts until he powered up his swords. At this point, I switched to fan daggers, dodged the gravity pull, and got behind him for a thorough pelting. Look at that damage from the fan daggers. After dodging his meteor, I switched to Kukri which I used until I got the bleed proc. I only took one hit this whole fight, which was here because I got too excited, but thankfully the shield saved me. After this, I switched to normal throwing daggers, dodged some of his attacks with torrent, and finally landed the killing shot. At last, I purged the scourge and I had stars in my eyes. After the one-shot festival that had just occurred, I felt it was probably sensible to put some points into vigor to hopefully avoid that happening again. So now, it's time to not chronicle my journey down into the underground city. Of course, we must first face the toughest opponent in life, ourselves. I don't really have a lot of material for this fight. I'd honestly been really hoping Mimic Tear would bust out some knives themselves for a sweet knife fight, but they just kept going in for punches. After some Kukri bleeds, Mimic Tear decided to engage its annoying NPC consumable dodging attack, but with enough throwing knife persistence, the only thing this boss ends up mimicking is a corpse. Well, as we're here, there is actually another Remembrance boss we can tackle, the Regal Ancestor Spirit, a fight that I very rarely do to be honest. I didn't actually look up if it could be poisoned, but after exhausting about 20 poison bone darts, I think I got my answer. I also wasn't sure whether it could be bled or not, and it turns out it can. It did take a lot of kukri though. The healing was also a concern as my resources are limited, but thankfully, 
the damage was enough to get the job done, and with one final throwing knife, Miyazaki's creation was spirited away. I now descend down into Nokron, doing my best Indiana Jones impression, and then grab the Finger Slayer blade to give to Rani. So let's take on the Valiant Gargoyles. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going anywhere near that. Nope, I'd rather go to this beautiful place instead. Even though I didn't need to this run, I thought I'd take on the Blitheful Shadow just for the hell of it. He appears weak to both poison and bleed. I waited for him to attack, and thankfully compared to other NPC fights, he does remain stationary for a good bit of time, after which was perfect for a knife-based assault. Throwing daggers to the face caused him to bail from this mortal coil. This gives us the palace key to be able to grab the Dark Moon Ring from Renala's room. Now as much as I, like many others, don't think the Lake of Rot is a particularly good area, I have to say at least it's quick to get through compared to having to slog through some of the other swamps in the older games, like 5-2 in Demon Souls or Farron Woods in Dark Souls 3. You know what the best way to see the stars in this fight is? With an astelloscope. Okay, jokes aside, it turns out he can be poisoned which is great news. The not so great news is that I struggle dodging his one hit kill grab attack. Genuinely, one of my least favourite moves in the game, up there with god devouring serpent's earthquake attack. On second attempt, I got him down to half health with just the poison and bone darts. Staying at mid range and hitting him in the head is a pretty solid strategy. I love how hitting some enemies with projectiles makes them attack in random directions. After his meteor attack, I decided to switch to Kukri as I know he can be bled, but it again took a lot of Kukri to actually manage it. I managed to dodge the grab when he attempted it this time, and finally after 20 Kukri, the bleed hit, and he was almost done. Hitting him with the Kukri at the end just caused him to keep doing close range attacks even though I was actually out of range. This natural born wasn't able to avoid our knives, and another Remembrance boss is down. I think there's something I should address here. I'm taking down some of these bosses easier than even on normal runs, like first or second attempt. Who knows how long this will continue, but the knives in Elden Ring are actually pretty incredible. I legged it up to Lanedale, grabbed some more golden seeds, and prepared to face Margit once again. Oh, I didn't expect that to just kill him. Um, okay then. So, Draki Tree. The classic sneak up behind strat is great here, as it lets me get the poison in. Now, this guy, as you probably know, has some attacks to specifically counter ranged attackers, those being the fireball and then the lightning strike in the second phase both of which I seem to struggle to avoid here. This was far from a clean fight. I managed to get one bleed off on him, but getting a second didn't seem to happen, so I switched to poison him again, and then used the bone darts from a distance. There were a couple of near deaths from me here, crucial dodges at crucial moments saved me, and a few final darts defeated this sentry. Lanedale Royal Capital is an awesome area. As well as being the first encounter with the pipe-wielding envoys, my favourite enemies in the game, it's also full of satisfying opportunities to pull off parkour to get to new places. It's also home to Goldfree, one of the first bosses in quite a while who can't be poisoned or bled. Thankfully, his moveset is pretty predictable. Throwing a knife usually causes him to dash and stomp, a move that's easy to roll through and punish. Not to keep throwing shade, but this was very straightforward and he goes down quick. Before moving onwards, as we now have a new talisman slot again, I grab the Ritual Shield Talisman, boosting our defences by 30% when we're at full health. Our Vigor isn't the highest right now, so I think this will help with the coming fights. And speaking of combing feats, it's now time to fight Morgoth. After getting our usual poison in, I made use of the Shackle to stun him, and then rain down the Fan Daggers. That is some good damage there. With two rounds of this, it brings him to just above half health. One Kukri then brings him below, and we can smash him with a bunch more during his phase transition to proc that sweet bleed. Now, if there's one attack that tends to catch me, it's the charging spear attack as evidenced here, and with him on low health, he did indeed catch me. As he was about to then throw the spear at me, I quickly changed to bone darts and finished him off to continue our momentum. Of course, Morgoth mocked me and I was denied access to the VI tree only section. So instead, I thought I'd go have some shun in the subterranean funning grounds. Here, Paul White gave me a choke slam. I paid a visit to Dark Souls 1, lobsters sprayed me with urine, I grabbed an item from Fifty Shades of Moog, and had a lift ride in a cage, which was the most relaxing part of the whole area. Sewer Moog, or as I like to call him Moog Light, is immune to both poison and bleed because he's an illusion or something. The shackle allows me to smash him with fan daggers, much like we did to Morgoth, 
and the two uses bring him down to half health. I kept using the fan daggers for a little while after this, but I need to be right up close for max damage, so I did swap to the bone darts and the classic throwing dagger instead. The attack where he makes blood rain down upon him is the perfect opening to chuck knives, and with enough dodging and persistence, Moog gets flushed down the drain. Well, even further down. You know what I mean. After unbelievably first trying the drop section beyond Moog and unlocking our way to the deep root depths, I remembered that I actually needed to complete the carry and study hall first. So I flipped, dropped, pushed, and then beat this noble skin god in about 90 seconds with a combo of poison and bleed. Interesting to note that the noble does not dodge the knives. Remember that, it'll be important later. But speaking of dodging projectiles, it's now time to face one of the hardest bosses of the entire run. No, I'm not joking. Fierce Champions killed me more than any other boss up to this point. Remember how I complained about NPC enemies dodging projectiles earlier? Well, this fight is five projectile dodging NPCs in a row, particularly fighting three of them at once. I mean, look at this. While it's not impossible to land hits, I end up wasting so many of my knives, and because it's three on one, I can't even wait for a safe window on one as one of the others will likely assault me. The damage is also surprisingly high. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm going to need to leave this for now and head on to something easier to strengthen myself, so let's head to the mountaintops to get to Fire Giant instead. Yes, you've heard that right. Fia's champions are too hard, so I had to go try Fire Giant instead. There we go. Much bloody easier. So how do we take down this gigantic boss with one of the largest health pools in the game with just throwing knives? This guy is usually a massive pain, and there were some deaths here for sure, but here, let me show you what I did. I actually started with the fan daggers here, casting Golden Vow and using them to break his ankle. You'd be pretty surprised how much damage I can stack up. I got up to 8,000 on the winning attempt. After this, I switched to poison bone darts to get the poison in, and then used the bone darts and throwing knives to get me through to phase two. At the start, when he leans over to do the fire tempest attack, it's actually a good time to smash him with some more fan daggers. I stayed in front of him as much as possible, using poison bone darts, which I just about had enough to proc the poison on him again. Finally, I thankfully avoided his flamethrower breath attack and used the kukri to get a winning bleed proc which finished off the fight. This boss was fired and this was a giant victory for the run. Speaking of fire, Melina commits some large scale arson but I slept through it and woke up in Ferumbling Azula where the residents gave me a warm welcome. Now, before too many attempts at the best duo boss since Syphilis and COVID-19, I decided I needed to power myself up a bit more and go tie up some other loose ends. At least it meant this run will have a lot of variation, so I killed Magnus the Beast Claw by bleeding him out, which felt appropriate, and fulfilled the other requirement to get into Mogwin Palace. And guess what? It is actually possible to do the bird trick with the Kukri, so that's something to crow about. Flying Dragon Fail is also pretty easy to cheese for a cool 80k souls. I was also curious to see how I'd fare against Commander Nial up in Castle Sol. Thankfully, Fan Daggers make quick work of his summons, which is great news. It's funny because I used to really struggle with this guy, but having any kind of ranged attack makes this fight very easy. Bait the Flying Lightning Kick, create distance, and then fire your projectile of choice. Rinse and repeat, and the Commander Nial's down before me, giving me his peg leg, which I will never use. So with strength, dex, and health leveled, the Godskin duo fight should be much easier, right? Well, you just knew if one fight was going to cause issues, it would be this one. The duo can be bled and poisoned, but each time either status procs on one of them, both gain a higher resistance to it. But, after a bit of testing, I decided my strategy would in fact be to not attack the Apostle at all. This was for two reasons. First, remember how I said earlier the Noble doesn't dodge projectiles? Well, the Apostle does, so better not to waste any, although I do poison him just once at the beginning of the fight to help chip away at his health bar. Secondly, a great opportunity to damage this noble is actually the rolling attack. If you stand on a broken pillar, the noble just rolls at you and you can spam fan daggers. Now, if the apostle is above half health, it remains more passive and won't attack you for the most part, apart from maybe an occasional fireball, but if it's in phase 2, it's a lot more aggressive and it will attack you. I keep the fan daggers only for this one attack opportunity, Otherwise, I use bone darts, throwing daggers, etc. I saved the Kukri for the latter part of the fight to crack out a bleed proc at a crucial moment. With their health low and the rolling attack pillar situation about to occur, I went in hoping to end it. Unfortunately, 
I was too excited and forgot that throwing the knives moves me forward and I got smacked by the noble's roll. I finished off the noble quickly, but now I had no choice but to attack the apostle who dodged furiously, but thankfully I at last landed the final knife to end this trauma. I had some real god skin in the game here and I feel gratitude for this noble victory. Next up, I tried to tell Plassey that little Timmy has got stuck down the well again, but he just shot lightning at me. Rude. Well, that's all the reason I need to get knifey. Unlike many of the previous bosses, Lake Placid has huge poison resist, meaning that it took 20 poison bone darts to proc it. Following this, I unloaded my stock of bone darts and throwing daggers into him until phase 2 began, at which point I switched to the Kukri. Luckily, he has some pretty wide attack windows, but he also has some pretty high bleed resistance. It actually took 25 Kukri to get the bleed, which is pretty wild, and of course now it's time for the laser attack. I'd spaced myself far enough away, and with 20% health left, it was time for Golden Vow and the Fan Daggers. I wanted to be as close as possible to him when I launched my assault, so I waited until I got an attack with a big opening after. The one I really wanted was the big left claw swipe, followed by the gold fire, and when I got it, boy was our damage good. A few further Fan Daggers, and this 8.5 minute battle with Dragon Lord Plesioth is over. Comment below if you remember that from Monster Hunter and how much fighting it sucked. We're nearly at the end of the Faramazula boss rush here, and we finish with Maliketh. Now, there's usually two Elden Ring bosses whose attacks I really struggle dodging, and unfortunately, Maliketh is one of them. Beast Clergyman is easy enough, but Maliketh's light speed attacks often catch me off guard, and he can absolutely decimate you in seconds. If I was going to continue being naked, which obviously I was, I decided to go for a bit of a grind and slightly respect my stats until they looked a bit like this. I did better and came within a fraction of winning, but I got too excited and kept attacking when I should have gotten away, leading to me being Black Blade to rest. On the winning attempt, I'm actually surprised I won. I got hit a lot of times by his attacks, but somehow managed to survive thanks to my larger HP pool. The poison kept chipping away at him, and I kept capitalising on the few attacks I could consistently avoid with fan daggers. Eventually, it caused him to breathe his last mala breath. This was very far from a clean fight, but I'll take it. The next section of the game began like many mornings at university, waking up in my underwear painted green in some place I didn't recognise. I know I used a version of this joke earlier in the video, but I can't understate how many times that's happened to me in my life. Before heading down the route leading to the final boss, I felt it was finally time to come back to the boss that I had been waking up in cold sweats thinking about, Fia's Champions. This was still just as bad as I had feared. The constant dodging was insufferable, and I wasted so many of my knives. I did do better damage, but it was a long process of waiting for specific openings to be able to land the knives. The whole fight took a total of 11 minutes, but honestly it felt even longer. The enemies generically named Fierce Champions, as opposed to Lionel, took a lot more damage, more so from the Kukri than anything else. After running and waiting for several minutes, I finally got it down to just Lionel Richie and me. With him on his own, he turned the dodging and projectile spamming up to 11 until I managed to show him once, twice, three times a Kukri. God, that was awful. The, the fight, not the joke. The joke was excellent, 10 out of 10. So at last, we do all those weird dialogue options with Fia along with whatever the hell I'm doing here, and we can fight 46. Compared to the champions, this was an absolute cakewalk. He gets poisoned quickly, and shots to his head do a lot more damage. The Kukri let us get a sweet bleed proc, and then some fan daggers to the face bring him down. We lick this dragon, that's for sure. Given how awful the champions had been, I was pretty sure Gideon off knew it was going to be a similar level of frustration, and of course, my fears were validated. I mean, this fight is really annoying anyway, but this ups that significantly. But, there is one window I found to attack, which is when he charges up Comet Azor, but you have to notice he's doing it, and throw the Kukri right away so you still have time to dodge. I opted for the Kukri, as they have the longest range of any of the knives, and they can bleed him out. I later found by standing on the high platform, that the Kukri would actually headshot him, interrupting the attack. It was a boring fight, but at least it was over now. I decided I wanted to grab the purifying crystal tier, as there's a certain boss we need it for, but I really couldn't be bothered with yet another NPC fight, so I instead opted to use a much easier strategy to get it. There we are, much easier. My initial strategy for Moog was to bleed him out with Kukri, then poison him right before the phase transition, then use the fan daggers while he's transitioning, and then fail to dodge leading to me getting bled out. It was right after this I remembered, 
oh wait, I have the shackle. So instead, I shackled him, used fan daggers, then used bone darts to lower him to just below half health, used the shackle, fan dagger combo again, and then got behind him to smash in some more fan daggers while he phase transitions. They say every Moog has his day, and this was certainly true here. In phase two, I procced the poison, and now it was Kukri time. The reach on these things is tremendous, a Moog being weak to bleed allows us to proc it twice quickly, and then a few more hit him to finish the job. Fear the old blood, Moog. Fear the old blood. Godfrey is our next target as we edge ever closer to the end. You might have noticed the pattern with the way I approach a lot of these bosses. I generally tend to use the weaker knives combined with poison during their usually easier first phases to weaken their health and save the stronger knives like fan daggers and kukri for the later phases of the fight. The same applies to Godfrey here. I save the fan daggers for when he does the charge up for his arena wide AoEs as dodging these leaves a nice window to lay in about 6 fan daggers. I then stick with the fan daggers until we begin the true second phase of the fight, Hora the Explorer. Here, the opportunities to attack are decreased, especially to be close enough to land all the fan daggers, so I decided to switch out to the Kukri to fish for that bleed proc. It was not the cleanest, and there were a few moments that reminded me of my trip to Wembley Stadium back in August, but we finally got the bleed, bringing him pretty low. I switch back to fan daggers, and after dodging one more grab, Hora loses this fight to the number one Naifu in the lands between. Now, before we continue, there was a bit of prep I wanted to get done. Remember earlier when I talked about leveling Faith to use the incantation version of Golden Vow, but then never actually did it? Well, I hadn't needed to up till this point, but I knew the upcoming challenge would require me to have every advantage at my disposal. So first, I grabbed the Halig Drake plus two talisman, then got the Golden Vow incantation, as well as the Flame Grant Me Strength incantation, and even the Jellyfish Shield and Godric's Great Rune, before respecking my stats to give myself the faith to cast the incantations needed. So, before we get into the finale, let's touch on the other two Remembrance bosses we haven't done yet, and what the situation was with them. I actually did these at a later point, but I felt it made sense to put them here in the video, starting with Rykard. I blasted through Volcano Manor, and Godskin Noble was no issue at this stage, far easier than pretty much everything else we've gotten through. His health pool went from God Rich to God Skint. Now Rykard. If there was one Remembrance boss I was fairly sure wasn't going to be possible, it was this one just from the sheer size of his health pool. But here's the thing, I actually got pretty close. If you see his health here, I had 4 Kukri and 12 Poison Bone Darts left. He'd already been bled and poisoned twice in this phase, so I'd say it's unlikely it would happen again here. It might be possible if I swapped out HP flasks for FP and cast the buffs the whole time instead of just at the beginning, but the damage here relies in part on the Ritual Sword Talisman, and there are some attacks I still have never been able to figure out how to avoid consistently. Like this one for example, I honestly dislike this more than Waterfowl Dance. The Red Tearstone Talisman would also have pushed us over, but no hitting Rykard when he has attacks like the aforementioned one or the crazy hellscape in the second phase? Yeah, I don't think so. He manages to slither away with this one, but I'm pretty happy with how far we got. So next, of course, let's head to the Halig Tree. First, I gotta clear this Ever Jail. Nah, just kidding, let's totally cheat. Oh, well, that's been patched. Fine, I'll do it normally. Stop shooting magic arrows! I hate these guys so much. So onwards and downwards we make it to Loretta. She's actually pretty easy and I can stagger her with fan daggers if I'm standing at the right angle. She did catch me off guard with an attack I'd never seen before, but overall this was fine and this horse rider turned into a hearse rider in record time. Millennia, millennia, millennia. Let's talk about this. So there's a few problems here. Just like most NPC sized bosses, she dodges projectiles, but unlike them, she has a massive health bar. So it's a massive waiting game for periods where she won't dodge projectiles, as I need pretty much all of them to hit. But my normal strongest damage dealers all have individual problems. Kukri are slow, but also because the opportunities to hit her are so infrequent, it means that actually procking bleed is very difficult, and it takes about 20 just to do it once. To get the max damage out of the fan daggers, I need to be right next to her for all of them to hit because she's a fairly small target. This is only really feasible after one or two attacks. She can be poisoned, but her resistance is so high that it takes almost all the bone darts to poison her. Now, all of that could be overcome, as technically I do have the damage to deplete her health bar, but there is one thing that, at least for me, makes it infeasible. The healing. Because our knives do such low damage, and we have a limited number of them, 
Any healing she manages to do from hitting us really sets us back, almost to the point that we'd need to restart the fight because of how limited the ammunition is compared to how high her health bar is. For this to happen, similar to Rikard, I'd have to almost no-hit Millennia, and uh, look, I I'm sure there's somebody out there that could do this, but unfortunately, that is above my skill level, and yeah, it, it, it didn't happen. It's a shame, but my true goal, as I stated from the beginning, is to beat the final boss, so let's go do that. Now, with the exception of Godskin Duo and Malaketh, everything else we'd beaten up until this point had been, I, I don't want to say easy, but it hadn't taken me too many attempts to pull off, and even Malaketh and Godskin Duo had been in under 10 tries. But Radagon and Elden Beast, much like they did to my face, absolutely smashed that number. This was an enormous difficulty spike for this run, I died a lot. There's quite a few issues. Both are immune to bleed, so that's off the table, and Elden Beast is immune to poison. Radigan can be poisoned, but it takes quite a few darts to even proc it. I want to do my same strategy as before of keeping my fan daggers and kukri for Elden Beast, but beating Radigan with just our weaker knives is problematic, because guess what kind of damage he resists? Pierce damage. You know, the damage type that all our knives do? So, to say the damage is low is a bit of an understatement. Also, remember I said earlier there's another boss as well as Malaketh whose attacks I struggle to dodge? Well, Radagon unfortunately is the other one. I am so good at getting caught by this guy's attacks, it's unreal. Just something about his movement and the follow-ups just really throw me off. Also, guess what? He can parry our knives just like other projectiles. I would start every fight by using Golden Vow, Flame Grant Me Strength, and the Jellyfish Shield buff outside the Fog Gate, and from there I tried a few different strategies. I initially thought, let me switch up my usual strat and use Fan Daggers to take out Radigan quickly. Although this worked great for the initial moments where he stands still, getting the chance to land all the knives required me to be at close range, which wasn't always possible. But still, I got him down to half health, used the Poison Darts to proc the Poison, which took about 20 to do, and to be fair, doesn't even do that much damage. Then, I switched to some of my weaker knives. Because I needed all the damage I can get, I was actually using crystal darts for the first time, which adds a further complication in that they use FP, so I had to carry an extra Cerulean Flask if I wanted to be able to apply my buffs again before the Elden Beast fight. Many times, I didn't even make it through to Elden Beast, as the Radigan fight was so long and gruelling, and I'd lose concentration and make silly mistakes near the end. Even on the time I managed to defeat Radigan, when I got to Elden Beast, I was almost shaking with nerves as I'd already been fighting for 8 minutes at that point. Which doesn't sound that long compared to some of the other fights I've done, but it's pure concentration for that time, with no downtime. With Elden Beast, you can get a lot of damage in right at the start with the buff Fan Daggers, usually getting a quarter of its health off. I find this fight often comes down to how much Elden Beast does melee attacks or decides to spam the projectiles. On one attempt, I got Elden Beast down to about 20% of his health left, only to die after fighting for 15 straight minutes across the two phases, which was... heartbreaking, to say the least. After more or less the same thing happening again a few tries later, but with Elden Stars this time causing me issue, I remembered something which I had completely forgotten about. The Crimson Wall Bubble Tear. I'm pretty sure I didn't pronounce that right. But anyway, this can absorb any non-physical damage for about 15 seconds, the perfect foil for Elden Stars. I also grabbed the Millicent's Prosthesis Talisman for the Dex, and also repeated attack buildup, which does appear to work with knives, and I did one final last bit of absolutely brutal grinding. This is what my final talisman setup looked like. It was now or never. Had I finally learned to be able to dodge Radigan's attacks? Could I steady my nerve for the full quarter hour needed to complete this godforsaken fight? Could I bring the conclusion that this six month knife saga deserved? Well, here. This is J.K. Lee's last stand, a knife well lived.
Truly, thank you all for watching and supporting the channel. 2023 has been a wonderful year for me, and I genuinely hope you've enjoyed my content. Although the Knife Saga has come to a close, at least until we get to the Elden Ring DLC, don't worry, there are many more videos to come. If you enjoyed this, please consider giving a like and a subscribe and a comment to let me know. Have a great holiday period and new year. I've been JK Leeds, see ya, and have a good one.